Hey guys, Rob Duncan, greetings from Southeast Asia. I wanted to give you an overview of my paper, worked on Leslie Newbiggin, his ecclesiology, his missiology, and uh, sort of his argument for the collapse of the sacred and uh, the, the collapse of the sacred secular divide. Um, so his just power of the laity doing ministry um, in the church. And so I want to give you a quick overview of his um, background of Newbiggin's life. Um, and then talk a little bit about, then I'll hit on his ecclesiology as we go forward on that. Uh, Leslie Newbiggin was born in 1909 in Newcaster, Newcastle on Tyre, which is in the um, northeastern section of the UK, uh, of England. Um, born into a Christian home. Father was a Christian businessman that was running an international shipping business. And Leslie always thought that he would go back into the family business and continue that um, that path along with his father. He's, his father being a Christian businessman was instrumental in or was very interested in infusing in Christian beliefs, Christian ethics into his business practices, and that was instrumental and formative for Leslie Newbigin. And so, he, you know, he thought he was going to go back into the business, read uh, geography at Cambridge University, but interestingly, at about age 18, had a real crisis of faith and walked away from the faith completely, didn't have any um, use for Christianity. It wasn't until while he was at university, he had a, literally a vision. Um, God spoke to him, Christ came to him in, the, in a vision, and he reclaimed his faith. And he took hold of it, uh, put it into practice working with the student Christian movement, and he was very, very active in that, active in leadership with that. And pretty much if he saw something, one of the actual things he did is he thought that it was going to be a place for people to work out their faith in the workplace. And But he noticed there was no training within the, the group, so he went off and created the training himself and went off and did it. So he's one of those guys that didn't take no for an answer, and if he saw that there was a need and it wasn't being supplied, then he was going to go figure it out himself and how to do it. So that's... Kind of talks a little bit about that. That's who he's going to. Um, and uh, he met his future wife through the campus ministry as well. They worked together through the campus ministry several years um, as they led up to their departure to go to the field. They got married in 1936, and she was the daughter of, uh, she was an MK, daughters of missionaries to India. So they went back, felt the call to go back to India where she had grown up and had some experience there. So in 1936, they sailed to India, and from that point on, off and on for about 35, 40 years, they serve in India. Um, they also serve globally. Um, doing church planting, doing mission type work there through the uh, under the auspices of the Scottish Church. About 1950 to 1965, he also got involved with the World Council of Churches, the International Missionary Council, when those two organizations merged, took up some leadership positions there, traveled around the world uh, speaking on ecumenical issues, um, but always being a, a proponent of um, local churches serving the mission of God, being active in that, and doing it and doing it really, really well. Um, 1965, returned back to the field, went back to India, wasn't quite ready to retire, got there. They served for another about nine, ten years there. 1975, retired, went back to the UK. Didn't quite retire, though, still. Uh, continued to pastor, preach, write, speak, travel the world, uh, speaking on ecumenical issues and uh, being a leader uh, and a proponent for the church, uh, getting on mission for God and getting uh, in line with the mission of God. He thought that the church was the ultimate... Um, so it, wasn't, it was the end and the means to the end, as, as if you will, as you move forward. A uh, very uh, prolific writer and producer of materials. He wrote prior to retirement, wrote 17 books and a little over 50 articles. Post-retirement, he slowed down on the book front, only wrote 15, but he put out 160 different articles that he wrote um, and speaking engagements. So very, very prolific um, writer, put out a lot of material, good stuff. If you can get your hands on it, um, I encourage you to read it. Really, really interesting stuff. So let's talk a little bit about sort of um, the local congregation, his um, ecclesiology, and um, I want to do this by giving you some, some quotes directly from Newbiggin so you can kind of really hear in his words what his thoughts are on some of these topics that we're looking at uh, talking about. Um, first of all, he just starts off, he says, the mission of God is not ours, but God chooses men and women for the service of his mission. To be Christian is to be part of a chosen company, chosen not for privilege, but for responsibility. He takes this mission that we are on as followers of Jesus to be incredibly serious. And it's an obligation, it's a responsibility that we have to do. And he talks about there, that there can't be a separation between conversion and obedience. Uh, Bill Hall talks about this in one of his new books too, coming, uh, lately coming out. But you know, conversion and, and discipleship, they, they're one and the same. They're not the same. Once you become converted, you, you start on this discipleship path and you keep going. Um, it's a total change of direction, Newbigin says, uh, which includes both the inner reorientation of the heart and mind and the outward re reorientation of conduct in all areas of life. And that all areas of life is so important. That's what he's getting at when he wants to see his churchmen, his church members going out and infusing being salt and light out in the community. 
um, the church is always part of the solution for him, regardless sort of what the what the problem is in Christianity. You talk about any kind of issue within the Christian sphere, the church is the answer for him because it's just it's so pivotal um, in all he does. Um, because it was, he says, it's Christian faith is not meant to be privatized; it's meant to be public, and so the community of faith, living it out publicly, is that proclamation of the gospel. And so that's vitally important for him. He talks about um, in urban societies, which I think is, is important going forward. Um, obviously I'm biased, live in a big urban city, but I think cities are going to be tremendously instrumental in, in seeing the gospel advance. But he talks about how people are feeling isolated, feeling individualized, and they're getting away from community. And he specifically responds that Jesus didn't write a book, but formed a community. So being community is something that should be positive and attractional to um, other people out there in the communities. He argues that the church, he said, how is the gospel going to become relevant to those in the world? His argument is the only answer, the only hermeneutic of the gospel is a congregation of men and women who believe it and live it. So it's people being disciples of Christ, living out their faith every day in the workplace, um, you know, in the schools and wherever they find themselves, living out their faith, that's going to be um, super important. He sort of repudiated or cut down the mission station approach to missions that had been done in India previously, and he did, really didn't like that. He said it was destroying the proper character of the local congregation. Uh, he was such a believer in locals doing ministry themselves. Uh, he quotes actually a quote the Bishop of Woolwich in 1952, and he quotes it in a 1961 paper, but he goes back, and I think it's really interesting because Bishop says, the coming pattern of ministry is bound to be largely non-professional in the sense that its priesthood will consist in great proportion of men working in secular jobs at every level, both manual and administrative. Um, again, I think, sorry, 1952 ladies, um, or a little sexist, but I think now we, we could safely say men and women living out their faith in the marketplace um, is going to be um, that, that priesthood, that's going to be the driving force moving forward. And he's responding in that to the closing of China and, and things happening there. We're seeing it today where borders are being closed. It's harder and harder to get in unless you have a valid reason for being in a country. These countries aren't just going to let you in. There's no reason for them to do that. They're trying to protect, they're not trying to keep out um, religious workers. They're trying to actually protect their borders for economic gain and terrorism and all these other sort of things. But we get caught up into it. So unless we have valid identity, it makes it much more difficult for us to be here. Newbigin talks about that it's even hard for church leaders, and church leaders need to come to uh, come to an understanding of this. This is sort of a paradigm shift for them. That he says it's still hard to bring even keen and instructed churchmen, which would be leadership, to the point of seeing that the church's life and witness, her encounter with the world, and therefore her place of obedience, is precisely in the work of her lay members from Monday to Saturday. So again, this paradigm shift is crucial for him for getting these leadership to think that they're not the sole end all and be all that their job is to be empowerers encouragers and enablers for the local minister lo local laity to become the ministers to be, be the priests out there in the field doing it he, he talks about he specifically says the ministers must be enablers instead of performers um, again, he's not saying that they don't need to be performing, they don't need to be not doing evangelism, not being out there doing, doing ministry, but that they, their primary role is to empower and enable the local congregation to live that out and do that on a regular basis. Um, he talks about that the people in the office, he said the church can come out and say all things they want to do in, in culture, on issues of culture, he said, but the real power, he said, it is much more important that all its lay members be prepared and equipped to think out the relationship of their faith in their to their secular work. I'm sorry. He says, here is where the real missionary encounter takes place. So the church can comment about social issues, social woes, moral failings, all they want to. But he said the real power is when laity, when people are living out and thinking about their faith and putting it into practice, that other people get to see it. That's where the real missionary encounter takes place. And that's a big, that's a that's a big sort of um, shift if you will. He talks about that men and women are not ordained in the, to this ministerial priesthood in order to take the priesthood away from the people, but in order to nourish and sustain the priesthood of the people. So again, back to the leadership. Leadership is so key. It's not to take the priesthood away from them. It's to empower the people and give the priesthood back to the people and let them be the priests out there in the world um, doing it. And 
you know, kind of to close, he says, ministerial leadership is first and foremost discipleship. Nothing more, nothing less. That's what it is. It's solid discipleship of people, getting people to live out their faith in the workplace, in the marketplace, in the schools, in their families, however they do it, just out there in the real world, tested in the fires of worldly experiences. That's where the missionary encounter is going to come place. And that's going to be the, the really powerful witness in the world. So that's all I've got on Leslie Newbigin, his missiology and ecclesiology. And uh, thanks for listening. And if you get a chance, pick up uh, some of his writings and take a, take a read. I don't think you will be disappointed and will be highly rewarded. Thanks, guys. Take care.